Hello, I'm Andrew Mazzoni, president of the Henry George School of Social Science. Welcome to Smart Talk. On this program, we hold discussions with leading economists and social scientists from around the world. There are no rules about what topics are brought to the table. The result is a collection of frank and compelling conversations. Our guest today, who is joining us via Skype, is Dr. Joyadi Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is a professor of economics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India. She specializes in globalization, international finance, and employment patterns in developing countries. Dr. Ghosh, welcome to Smart Talk. Jayadi, I've, I've read a lot of your papers and, and your works. And essentially, you're coming up with a, an eclectic view of socialism, rebuilding the movement. And, uh, and I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, it's uh, between feminism, indigenous movements, uh, uh, protecting nature. All of this is well and good and, and, certainly, and certainly to the point. And also your analysis of the crisis, the Greek crisis, the European crisis and all of that, the 2008 debacle is all spot on. No, no question about it. My, but my question to you is, can we really have a socialist renaissance with such fragmentation? I think we have no option. I think we have to live with the fact that this is the world as we know it, which is fragmented. And in a sense, you know, I think the problem maybe with previous attempts at socialism is precisely that, that we tried to be too overarching. We tried to have one principle that was going to be the answer for everything, you know. Okay, so I, I, I accept that, but I'm coming from a real structuralist point of view. I'm, I'm certainly uh, aware of the... Uh, of the defects of uh, Karl Marx, especially as far as motivation of people, and uh, and the Soviet experiment, which was a cruel, but long long acting experiment, kind of kind of took the heart out of the social socialist movement because of its egregious failure. Now, from a Henry George per perspective, you could say we're on the left, but we're strictly don't allow monopolies to inure to civilization. It's almost a one-trick pony, and it's probably a powerful principle, but it's certainly not enough to, to, to satisfy the, the desires of people around the world. So I, we accept that, and I accept that. But going back to fragmented socialism, and, and I know it's well, well meant, the great ideas of the last 150 years were essentially, let's say, Marxian, Keynesian, we could say the uh, embeddedness of Polanyi. Those all had powerful structures that you could operate with in detail, but there was a main theme that you could come back to and get traction. I'm afraid with fragmented movements, you'll get, you'll get uh, episodes here that are working, episodes that don't work, and it, and it kind of plays into the hands of neoclassicals, because I'll give you a for instance. Uh, I'm a, an investment banker in New York. Uh, I'm in the capital city of this. And we have a structure. Even if it doesn't work, it blows up, we can get the state to pay us back and go back into action again. And, and I can even in the United States, I can look at and say, I don't need the whole United States as part of this structure. I can take New York, I can take Washington, I can take Boston, I can take elite centers around the world, London, and I can create a virtual neoclassical state that's militarily armed to the teeth, well-funded, immune from failure. Because if I fail, I can re restart myself. And I can put austerity onto everybody else and basically say Auster austerity will work because eventually expectations will be if you keep austerity, spontaneously capitalism will, will, will arise again. Well, you know, okay, let me put it this way. When I'm talking fragmented, I'm not saying that you have to be internally tiny little things and everything very micro. I'm not in favor of just very, very micro instances. I mean, I think a lot of these responses are also centralizing. They are also, in that sense, looking at the power of a state, but a more accountable, shall we say, a more democratic state. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the power of very, very large institutions globally, like monopolies, like multinational corporations, like you know financial markets that have this incredible powers. What I am saying is that the way an alternative is going to look in, let's say, Ecuador, will be very different from how it looks in Bangladesh, in some essential ways. 
although there will be some other features that are in common, which I would argue would have to be some degree of socialization of finance and much greater control over finance, much greater control of the state over what are, in fact, people's resources, particularly of nature, and much greater accountability of that state to the people, a much greater significance to ensuring proper livelihoods and employment to all people, and much greater respect for human dignity in, for all humans, which includes you know, marginalized groups, women, reduced social categories, and so on. These are the basic principles, but they will play out very differently. Okay, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and of course we can assert that, but I'm, I'm the enemy, just as a counterpoint here. And, and I see, you know, the various uh, disembedding of, for my neoclassical structure, into alternative structures. I see this going on. But I'm not really concerned about that because there's no real linkage between the areas. And as long as I can keep them uh, apart in detail, I have the resources to finesse the problem, give ground where I have to, I make deals where I have to. I mean, because I am running a, a system where I'm only concerned with 10% of the population. My 10% my of the population holds all the resources. We have all the titles to, we have all the military power. And yes, we, we know that everybody's waking up to that particular uh, fact. But again, take, take the American uh, polity in its elections. You, you're running essentially nonsense candidates to, uh, to, to manage the state who at the end of the day will have no power to do anything so we're, we're quite comfortable here with that, and we can do the same thing around the world. If we have to destabilize the Middle East, not a big deal. Uh, if we can keep India basically agri agricultural, except for a few areas which we can use their software, all well and good. We can take that in detail away from India. And we can keep playing this divide and conquer game, taking the elites from the smarter, the smarter students from all over the world, pay them off to be in our structure, and we can run a high-tech feudalism indefinitely. Yes, well, you know, I think in a sense you put your finger on the essence of the problem, which is that effectively you control the state. And you control the state despite democratic election, you meaning, let us say, large capital in various forms. And therefore it can continue to do what it's like, what it wants. And in fact, you cannot do all the other social transformations without changing that control over the state. So yes, you're absolutely right that as long as particular groups, large capital, certain elites can keep on controlling the state, this actually will keep on reproducing itself. It will reproduce itself with crises, with ecological disaster, with all kinds of other terrible things, but it will reproduce. So the critical thing is actually to somehow weaken that control over the state, to transform it into a popular control over the state. And I think there's no getting around that. So none of the progressive movements can succeed without getting some greater control over state power, state policies, and all of that. That's absolutely true. It's difficult. Is it impossible? I don't think so. I think we are told that it's impossible because now, let's face it, big capital controls the media, controls electoral processes, control, has lobbying power with everybody, controls the judiciary and so on and so forth. So we're told that we're kind of in this enclosed space where there's no movement possible. I think the examples of some countries in Latin America, increasingly the examples of some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa even, and in Asia, are showing us that that's not so true, that it's not as rigid as all that. So I'll give you some of South America, I'll give you some of uh, Africa, I'll give you some of Asia, I'll give you that simply because I can't police everything. Because I'm only interested in a small minority of the population. I'm interested in 10% of the population that are highly educated, control the money, and in effect, I'm creating a virtual, insulated world, a fortress that basically will, will, will sally forth and put down any real problems if they get out of hand. And as long as you don't have a, a combining idea for all of these small areas, I'm, I'm happy with this because there is no, I can continue to, to, to do the philosophies that I have, and they're robust enough to, to keep people at bay. And all I'm doing, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an investment banker in New York. I'm 50 years old, I have plenty of money. I'm gonna die in 20 years, let's say, 
And I know what you know, Giuliani. I, I know the deal here. I'm, not, I'm a smart guy. I'm a Goldman Sachs guy, for example. I don't care what happens after 20 years. I'm gone. I don't necessarily believe in the next world either. So you're fighting people who are going to optimize their lives here and now, who have the power, and who have the ability to confuse and fog the general population, and continue this and reproduce this, reproduce this, this structure ad infinitum. Now, I personally and we Georgists would say, okay, if we could double the size of the planet every 25 years and add new worlds, new worlds, new years, we could finesse this problem by expansion. We could, in effect, recreate the open American frontier and expand away these pressures. But in this planet, we cannot do that. We're enclosed and technology is powering into this planet and is going to create the solution anyway. The solution will be enough have-nots will just say enough at some point in time and all hell will break loose. As a Georgist, I would say, we have a strong idea, tax away monopoly, and that will relieve the pressure. At least it's a centralizing idea. Sure, no problem at all with taxing monopoly, but that's one of the things. And yes, it can be one of the things that captures people's imagination, but it's only a relatively small part, I would say, of what is required to capture the imagination of people across the developing world. It might work, but I want to just go back to what you were saying earlier. What you're describing is the notion of a bubble of, let's say, you know, people in Wall Street and the U.S. establishment and the military industrial complex, a bubble of people who think that they are all right no matter what. I think that's not true. I think that's an illusion. It's a myth. And in fact, these realities come back and bite you, whether you like it or not. But what I would argue is that these are bubbles when you create the kinds of chaos and instability that, let's face it, imperialism and capitalism are creating across the world today whether it is across swathes of the Middle East that are unimaginable today in terms of how they have deteriorated in physical security and so on. When you create the deep inequalities that are uh, now all over the developing world, you are creating problems that will not just stay in their own little places. They come back and pierce your bubble. So in fact, you may think, you may have the illusion that you can somehow be separate from it all and keep controlling it, but that's a false thing. It's not going to be sustained. That, okay. and, uh, that may be true. I, 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 I grant that, and I, and I argue that the finiteness of the planet, the increasing population and technology, will, will pressurize this into an explosion. But, but look at me as a, as a member of the establishment here. I only look to my lifetime. I don't care about the future necessarily. Now, I won't, of course, I, I worry about my kids and all that, but you know, I can argue, well, they'll take care of themselves just as I had to take care of myself. And yes, and I, and I do believe that Wall Street in some sense gets this whole problem. I mean, the idea of expanding out of America, hedging your bets all around the world is kind of an idea that you better start making plans to diversify in some sense. But, they would say, after me, the deluge. Okay, I accept the fact that this is going to blow up. But I'm not going to let up. And I'm going to take the last ounce out of this as long as I can to maximize my lifetime. And I am not going to compromise because I don't know what's in store for me if I do. You see? Sure. But you see, let me put it this way. Change has never come about because of a change of heart among the people at the top. That's not how it works. So let us assume that the people there, the, the group that you're talking about, doesn't want to change and is going to do everything it can to maintain its power, its privileges, and its domination. That, that is the story of history, right? The point is not change there. The point is that, in fact, change is forced on elites. It's not that they decide, oh, it's for the good of the planet, or it's good for other people, or it's good for social justice. No, change is forced on the elites by the people. Now, it really is that you have to get people much more organized and much more willing to believe, first of all, in some unifying principles. Sure, taxing monopoly is one, but it's not something that is going to grab everybody's mind all over the world. You need more of those. And the a greater belief that it can be done. I think the huge success in the recent decades of, you know, of this uh, tight elite is to actually persuade people that there is no alternative. 
somewhere deeply, in fact, there's this, we've all been conned into this thing that, oh, we're stuck. Mm. Okay, but I'm going to uh, argue again a little differently uh, from the lessons of recent history that, in effect, you're citing that this cannot hold because of the pressures. But one of the things that is very different today is the elites have made a conscious effort to recruit from all stratas of society, from all races and all class, classes, the best and brightest of the people, and in effect brought them in and said, look, we won't make it a race thing, we won't make it a, a, a class thing, we'll make it a brain power thing. Today the focus is identify anyone who's intelligent, educate them, and in effect give them a piece of the action and in effect put them as a, against everybody else. Now I'm, I'm drawing it to an extreme, but there is this centralizing tendency. Look at, the, look at the kids in all countries. All they want to do is get educated and be part of the system because they know if they don't, they're marginalized at the get-go. I don't agree with you that in fact the system takes the best and the brightest. Less and less does it do that. It used to, in fact, and certainly American capitalism had that tremendous dynamism. Less and less is that able to do that. The U.S. today is actually much closer to a patrimonial European kind of system of the past than it has ever been. And I think that's another sign of its decay. Really? Now, examine that point. I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I'm observing New York, which is the island of Tortuga, the classic uh, pirate island of the world here. All capital, all wealthy people hang their hat in this city. This is, this is the epicenter of it all. And if you look at the educational uh, draw New York has, Boston has, for elites all over the world as far as education, it's tremendous. And not only that, they get educated and they marry each other. It's just, and they segregate themselves. That segregation is as ferocious today as it's ever been. And, and certainly the attitudes of excluding everybody else simply because we're better because look at our education, look at our, our abilities, I think is as strong, as stronger than ever. So you and I have a little difference there. Go ahead. Well, no, but look at the costs of being educated in the U.S. today. And look at the, the, more, the larger and larger number of young people who are excluded from that, or at least from the top institutions, because of this absence of either rich parents or, you know, ability to access loans and so on and so forth. So, in fact, what you're talking about was true maybe two, three decades ago. It is really much less true today. Today, American higher education is actually a very elit elitist one. And unfortunately, that's being re reduced in many countries across the world. The top institutions, which are not public institutions, the private ones, increasingly you have to come from already a wealthy family or a privileged family to be able to access it at all. Okay, all right, I'll buy that. Now, I'm gonna to go to detail on something you're very familiar with and kind of illustrates a lot of the points we're talking about. Let's take Greece. The situation with Greece, is, which has become a focal point of a lot of the issues that we're, we're talking about. Now, it just so happened I interviewed Yanis Varoufakis twice, okay? and he's the point man of the finance minister of Greece. This is where a lot of this, these issues are playing out right now. If we had to take a model of uh, people trying to recapture their opportunities and establishment basically holding the line, we have a model in Greece. Uh, you have a populist movement that is ready to bolt from the system. And of course, you have uh, the European side, uh, primarily led by the Germans, who, who basically believe that austerity, because they can practice it since they have the leading technological product developing nation probably in the world, they can get away with austerity because they have export markets and they have a good currency and they, they essentially have momentum. And they're saying to the Greeks, the Greeks and all of, all of Europe, be tough, hold the ground, and eventually expectations will change and allow capitalism to redevelop through austerity. You know, I think the Greece example is fascinating because it, as you said, it kind of symbolizes this contradiction between capitalism and democracy. 
really, which is that, you know, you have a democratic desire of a society to go on a certain path and a trajectory. And basically, finance capital says, we won't let you. And I think it's particularly sharp in the Greek case because it's almost like the European Union, the ECB, the IMF, everybody, they want to make an example of Greece. They want to make sure that other countries don't get this contagion of thinking that they can get away with lo less austerity, that they can have less so-called fiscal discipline, and that they can actually improve by not following this, frankly, irrational and stupid medicine. So it's really like a test case that will they be able to enforce this on Greece? I wrote a letter informally to Varoufakis. I said, why don't you go to the Chinese and borrow Chinese currency and use that as your internal currency, default on your loans, use that as an internal currency, and use it ultimately as your trading currency. And you can always tell the Greek people, look, you want to change euros for the yuan, you can do that. It's both fixed, both can't be inflatable, and you can get out from under this because the Chinese would be glad to finance an incursion into Europe, especially the southern tier, to, to uh, sell their products at cheaper prices and allow the Greeks to have breathing room. Why won't they do that? You know, I, I agree with you completely. I have actually been surprised at why there hasn't been more of an effort in this direction. They don't need to use Chinese currency. The Chinese can give them dollars. They can give them euro. They can give them whichever currency they want. The, the Chinese have no shortage of any of the global currencies. And it's, to me, it's a bit of a mystery why there hasn't been more of an effort. I mean, apparently, you know, uh, Tsipras went to Russia. I would have thought that it's much more sensible to actually ask the Chinese for a grant or a loan, similar to what the Chinese Exim Bank gives to a lot of developing countries. They've just given 30 billion to Pakistan. They've given, you know, hundreds of billions to sub-Saharan Africa by now. For them to give a 60, 70 billion euro loan to Greece right now in euro, would really be no problem at all. I'm not sure what is stopping them, but I'm sure there is some geopolitical issue. I'll take the American Treasury Department's view on this. I simply wouldn't allow this. I mean, I think this would be an unraveling that I can't afford to do. So I would be telling the Chinese and, and Europeans in, in, in no uncertain terms, do not do this because, you know, we'll start to change the World Trade Organization. We will really create real, real problems if you allow this to happen. I don't think the Germans are the ones that are going to be the ones that are going to holler about this. I think the Americans will. China's not going to make an effort in something where it doesn't see a direct economic interest for itself, in which, the, if you like, the pros outweigh the cons. So that's another tragedy. Well, I would argue, I would argue if they could get a bit, if they can get away from possible military confrontation, it would pay for China to, to finance an inroad into southern Europe. You know, that's true. I think the ways that they would have to do it and the ways that Greece would have to think of doing it are really under the radar. I think Greece would have to think of, you know, bilateral kinds of quiet trade deals, not very loudly stated, where they export some things in return for much more imports of other things. They would have to think of an alternative currency, not in terms of a drachma, but some kind of state IOU that they would use to fund local employment schemes, which would be redeemable locally. You know, a lot of the Argentine provinces did that in the middle of the Argentine crisis. And I know that the Greek government is aware of those attempts. So they have to think of other ways of reviving liquidity in the economy. Yes. I. It looks that way, so we don't know what the future will bring. But let's say the Greeks somehow managed it. Well, then all of the disparate uh, insurgencies around the world would now have a unifying theme to tie together. So Greece has, if Greece won its battle, all of the, all of the local aut indigenous autonomous movements around the world would start to have a central focus with which they could focus around. And that would be a very powerful idea and probably one that couldn't be stopped. I agree with you because I think as, as we've talked about, it, it encapsulates the current dilemma of modern societies all over the globe, which is how do you deal with large capital when your societies, your people are bleeding because of their actions. And I think, you know, even if it doesn't 
win this particular round. I don't think we should see that this is the end of the road because it, the story of all the major changes, historical changes in the past three centuries has been that, that you get these fits and starts, you get these things that erupt and look like they could win and then they're, they're, you know, they're defeated, but then another one comes up and another one comes up. So I think we are entering that phase where you are going to get really a groundswell of different movements coming up all essentially saying something quite similar. So what you would call a unifying idea, what I would say is a basic principle, that large capital cannot be the determinant of the economic futures of all societies. But I think it's also that, you know, let's face it, I think we as Marxists, we, mis un we underestimated the power of capitalism to create new markets. What Rosa Luxemburg's insight did show is that capitalism, ha capitalism has to constantly encroach on, if you like, non-capitalist markets. She saw them in territorial terms. But I think the last few decades have shown us how you can create markets out of intellectual property, out of what used to be seen as public services and utilities, out of drinking water. I noticed you were drinking a, bot a bottled water. So the ability to create new markets is something that really has, in a sense, staved off this deep crisis of realization that uh, Luxembourg talked about for sure. However, when you combine that with the ecological crisis, which is already upon us, and it's upon us certainly even in much less developed regions of the world, I think the fact that this is heading towards a, a kind of catastrophic dead end is almost inevitable. Hmm. Your, your uh, article on pollution in Beijing was a, was a classic on that, you know? Joyati, thanks for joining us. Let's do it again. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of Smart Talk. In upcoming shows, we will be talking to such renowned economists as Dr. James Galbraith. Dr. Galbraith is a professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. His most recent book is Inequality and Instability, a study of the world economy just before the great crisis. Please post your questions or comments on our website at www.henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Andrew Mazzoni. We will see you again next time.